your labor. Then it's all in your name. Turn in your Bibles now to uh, Mark chapter 2. Our text is actually coming from Mark uh, 10, but we'll, our first reading will be from Mark chapter 2. Mark 2, verses 1 through 10. And when he had returned to Capernaum after some days, it was reported that he was at home. And many were gathered together so that there was, more, there was no more room, not even at the door. And he was preaching the word to them. And they came, bringing to him a paralytic carried by four men. And when they could not get near him because of the crowd, they removed the roof above him. And when they had made an opening, they let down the bed on which the paralytic lay. And when Jesus saw their faith, he said to the paralytic, Son, your sins are forgiven. Now some of the scribes are sitting there questioning in their hearts, Why does this man speak like this? He is blaspheming. Who can forgive sins but God alone? And immediately Jesus, perceiving in his spirit that they thus questioned within himself, within themselves, said to them, Why do you question these things in your heart? Which is easier, easier to say to the paralytic, Your sins are forgiven? Or to say, Rise, Take up your bed and walk, but that you may know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins. He said to the paralytic, I say to you, rise, pick up your bed, and go home. And he rose and immediately picked up his bed and went out before them all, so that they were all amazed and glorified God, saying, we never saw anything like this. Now turning to Mark chapter 10 and the words of our text. At verse 13, and they were bringing children to him that he might touch them, and the disciples rebuked them. But when Jesus saw it, he was indignant and said to them, let the, little, let the children come to me, do not hinder them, for to such belong the kingdom of God. Truly, I say to you, whoever does not receive the kingdom of God like a child shall not enter it. And he took them in his arms, and he blessed them, laying his hands on them. Thus ends our reading. Let's ask God's blessing on his word, if, if that's all right. Our Father, once again, we, having read your holy, infallible, and inspired word, um, Lord, we pray that you'd be with my mouth, that you'd bless uh, and bring together my thoughts, that I might speak a good word. And Father, we pray that by your spirit, you would apply this word that you would encourage, strengthen, lift up those that know you and believe in you. Encourage them and strengthen them in all that they need. But, Father, we also pray, too, for those that do not yet know you, that you'd have mercy and open their hearts by your word and spirit and guide them to Jesus Christ as the one true King of kings. All these things, Father, we ask in Jesus' name alone. Amen. I think that uh, if we didn't understand fully in the last couple of years, uh, many of us have come to understand in the last couple of years, particularly during the COVID crisis, uh, how important it is to bring up our sons and daughters in the way that they should go. I think in this congregation, that's probably not an issue so much. But, but it's amazing how in the last year and a half, since COVID began, how many parents around the country have finally woken up by God's grace, and thank God for this, that they have finally woken up to the fact that they, have, they did not realize and understand what their sons and daughters were being taught at these different schools, even some of the Christian schools. But because of COVID and them having to stay home and, and, and watch their kids learning online, 
they began to see and hear things that they knew was a problem. And, and, I, and I'm, I'm somewhat taken aback because I know that um, around the country that there are many that confess Christ that were sending their children to schools and had no idea of what they were being taught. But brothers and sisters, the truth is, it's not enough for fathers and mothers to be in charge of their children's education. It's not enough for you to teach them all the right things. It's not enough to warn them and guard them against all the evil garbage that's being taught, shown, and is being spread throughout on, on, on social media. The hard truth of the matter is, is that no matter how excellent of a parent you are, no matter how much you care and do your all to bring up your sons and daughters in the way that they should go, we cannot guard their souls. You and I do not have the ability to guard that precious thing inside of them called the human soul. You and I do not have the power to bring them from the, from the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of light. And your children are born in the kingdom of darkness, just as we all have been. That's the hard truth. The, 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 the good news is this. We don't have to. Make no mistake. I'm not saying that we're not called to do our all. I'm not saying that you don't bear a heavy responsibility to bring your sons and daughters up in the way you should go. But the weight of guarding their soul, the weight of bringing them from the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of light is on someone else. It's on our Lord Jesus Christ. We have someone who can and will guard their hearts and souls, and when it is time, he is the one who will bring them into the kingdom. In our text this evening, we see something beautiful and true happening to believe, when, when believers bring their children to Christ. And we're going to look at that in our text in terms of three things. First of all, the action of the parents. Second of all, the action of the disciples. And finally, the action of our Lord Jesus Christ. First of all, the action of the parents. And they were bringing children to him that he might touch them. Now, who are these people? Well, one of, the, one of the powerful things about this text is that they're anonymous. It doesn't even say that they're the parents, but they are the parents, right? Because back in those days, most people did not have the money to, to hire somebody else to take care of their kids, all right? So the parents are the ones taking the children. So it is the parents, but why are they not named? Why are they not designated? Well, that's part of the power of this text. This whole text is about humility. And one of the most humble things about it is these are unknown people. They have no names. They have no faces, but they're just like you and I. And the thing is that what these parents are doing is beautiful. It's powerful. Why are they bringing their, their sons and daughters to Jesus? Do they know who he is? Do they know that he's the Messiah, the son of David? Do they know that he's the proper king of, of not just Israel but all of the earth? No. The truth is, probably not. But here's what they know at a minimum. Here's what they believe at a minimum. At a minimum, they believe that he's like John the Baptist, that he is a man sent from heaven, that he's a man of God. And they believe that, just like they did of the Old Testament prophets, that these men were doors, that they were doors into the kingdom of God that they knew God and they had power with God, right? That's what they believed about John the Baptist. Remember what Jesus says, and, and this is near the end of his ministry, and he's on his way to Jerusalem to die, and just maybe a week later, he'll be in the temple, and he'll be preaching and teaching, and of course, many people are offended by some of the things that he says and does, and including the, 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 the chief priests and scribes. They come to him and say, by what authority do you do these things, right? And they're talking about throwing our money changers, et cetera, out of the, out of the temple. And he says, I got a question to ask you first. You answer mine, I'll answer yours. And he says, the, the baptism of John the Baptist, did it come from heaven or from earth? And they were stuck. Everybody knows the story, right? They were stuck because they were like, ooh, ouch. If we say that he came from heaven, his next question is going to be, then why didn't you listen to him? Why didn't you get baptized? Because they didn't get baptized. The Word of God is very clear about that. These men 
rejected the baptism of John. So we can't, he's going to ask us why we didn't get baptized, why, did, why we didn't honor the ministry of John the Baptist. On the other hand, if we say that John the Baptist is not from heaven, that he's not sent from God, then the people are going to stone us, right? The people are going to do away with us because they all know that he's from God. That's what these people believed about Jesus Christ. They believe, just like Nicodemus, that you are a teacher sent from God. So he knows God. He has power with God. That's what they believe at a very minimum. They believe that he can, that he can confer the blessings of God upon their children. That's what they believe. So they're coming in faith. And, and the reason that I, that I started with Mark chapter 2 is because I think that there's something implicit in this text that is explicit in Mark chapter 2. In Mark chapter 2, we have this beautiful story of these four men bringing a young boy. And, and, and he's probably 8, 10, 12 years old. We're not sure. But Jesus calls him son, which he usually does not do. When he's talking to an adult, he doesn't usually call an adult son. So, so this is probably a young man, and he's paralyzed, and he's, and he's being carried perhaps by his father and maybe his father and his brothers. Maybe he's got a bunch of older brothers. But he's being carried, and they come to this house, and right, because they've heard Jesus is, is in the house. He's in town. He's in Capernaum. And they know because they've heard about the ministry of Jesus Christ that he heals everybody, that, that there's no limitation on his healing. And so someone in that house says, you know what, we need to get you over to Jesus. But they get to the house, and, and not only is the house filled, but the courtyard is filled. There's no way to even get near the door, and nobody's letting them in. And maybe at that time, the young boy says, you know what, Dad, um, whoever, you know, we, we've tried. Maybe tomorrow's a better day. Maybe we should go. Maybe we'll come back, and, and Jesus won't be so busy tomorrow. Let's catch him tomorrow, maybe. And one of those four men said it, and the other three said, yeah. One of those four men said, today is the day. Today is the day. Today is the day of salvation. Today is the day. No, we're not going home. We're going to find a way. And they went up on the roof of their house, and they started digging a hole in the roof. Now, people were pretty particular about their, their, their private dwellings back in those days too. So there's no doubt that there's people that are yelling at them, perhaps maybe even Peter or the owner of the house, but they keep doing it and they get that hole open enough so that they can see Jesus, that they can see the approval on Jesus' face. And they let that young boy down there in front of him. And then he says this, when Jesus saw their faith, their faith, when he saw their faith, he said to the paralytic, your sins are forgiven you. It's explicit in that text, but I believe it's implicit in this text. In this text, it's not about the baby that's being brought. It's not about the little child that can be held in Jesus' arm that's being brought. It's about the people that are bringing him. It's about their faith. And we're not just talking, last, last week I preached on this text for a baptism. But it, it really strikes me that when we bring a child to be baptized, we're actually asking Jesus to touch him. And I'll, and I'll talk about that in just a moment. But the range of this text goes beyond just baptism. It speaks to today. It speaks of every day that you come to worship and to praise. That we should start the day out at our homes praying silently before the Lord and saying, Lord, we're going to go worship. We're going to go assemble ourselves to praise, to pray, and to hear the Word of God preached. And I want my son or my daughter to be touched by you. Because only you can do that. I can bring them there. I can teach them. I can have devotions with them. But I cannot open their heart. I cannot give them that desire to know you. 
Only you can do that. And I think this text is so powerful because Jesus honors that. They're bringing their, their, their children to be touched. What does that mean? That's actually a, a pretty special word. The, the word touched in the, in the uh, Greek, it's hapto. And if you look it up, it means to light or to touch. And the reason it means to light is because it's, it's speaking, and it, it was used primarily, um, the general sense of it is, is that it was a word that was um, used when you told someone to light a candle or to light a lamp or to light a fire. And it was speaking of a specific action that you would take fire, that you would take a coal, a burning coal, and that you would lay it on the thing that you wanted lit. There's a reason that the Holy Spirit's using this word. They were bringing their child to be touched. Because Jesus is the only one that can touch your child's heart and put the spirit in it and make it alive. They wanted that blessing. They wanted Jesus to touch with the fire of his spirit to bring that child and to give that child the blessing that only God can give them. So they came in faith, and they came for the greatest of reasons. But look at what it says. Look at the next thing that happens here, right? The, 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 the disciples' action. The disciples, we only have a few words here, right? And the disciples rebuked them, right? And, and um, why would they do that? Well, well, brothers and sisters, if you know the, if you understand the culture uh, of the Middle East and, and um, Judea, it's very simple, the disciples were actually doing something that was culturally sound. It, it was something that was regular. It, was, it would be expected. If there was any other rabbi in town or in the towns around there, and they were in the, and they, they were in the public, and, and uh, someone tried to bring children up to the rabbi, the other rabbi's disciples would have done the exact same thing. They would have pushed them away. You see... And, and this is kind of hard for us to get our minds around because in America, we've, we've messed things up so bad. We've put our children at the top of the heap and we actually worship children now, which is a horrifying thing. In the book of Isaiah, it says when you're doing that, the society is on its way out. We're, we're worshiping our children. We put our children in the middle now and everybody has to bow down and we all have to stop. And parents and people are visiting or whatever and some children come screaming and yelling into the middle and we all, oh, you know, we got to stop. That's wrong. But in their world, in their culture, it was 100% exactly the opposite. They had a very rigid structure, a very rigid hierarchy, a social hierarchy that people knew and people followed. And children were at the very bottom. In fact, from a social standpoint, children did not even have any standing at all. They, they didn't even, in some way, didn't even exist at a social level. Don't get me wrong. They loved their children. Their children were considered precious and gifts of God. But make no mistake, in the public square, a child was nothing. He was no one. And here's why. Because in the, in, in the Jewish um, context, you had to have standing to actually even be there, okay, to be in the public, to talk to a rabbi, whatever. You had to have some kind of standing. Children had no standing, brothers and sisters, because they had no responsibility. Children did, in, in the Jewish, from what I understand, in the, in, in the Jewish culture, they did not even sin until they were 12 years old. And what I mean by that is, is of course they sinned, but their parents bore the responsibility. Nobody came and said, Johnny and Susie did this. Well, they would come to you and say, Johnny broke our window. And they wouldn't look at Johnny. They'd look at you, the parent. You're going to pay. You're responsible. You're fully responsible, 100% responsible for your child's behavior. They're not even responsible for their own behavior. About four or five years old, what they would do is they would start teaching these children the law of God. They'd start memorizing it. In fact, they usually, usually almost everybody would memorize the first five books of Moses. And so from about 5 to 12, 5 to 13, they would, they would study, memorize the law of God, the testimonies, the precepts, statutes, etc. Then they would also have many deep discussions about 
what their responsibilities were. What does the law mean? How are you to, you know, how are you to treat people? How are you to direct, react in this situation? What does the law say about this? When you were ready, about 12 or 13 years old, you would come and you'd take a bar mitzvah or a bat mitzvah, bar mitzvah, son of the law, bat mitzvah, daughter of the law. You would take an examination. And if you passed your examination, you were formally accepted into society as a responsible member of society because now you are responsible for your behavior. But until you were responsible for your own behavior, you had no place in the public. So what they're doing is saying that, you know, Rabbi Jesus here, he's got, he's important. He's got many people to talk to. And more important, your children don't really have any standing. But if that's true, why is Jesus so upset? Look at what it says. When Jesus saw this, he was indignant. And the word there in the, in, in the Greek, and I love the word because it really speaks about pain. He, he literally felt pained. He felt pained at this. He, 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 he was so upset by it. It, it, it literally hurt him. Why? Why? Well, I think it's because he had about a week and a half to live. He was going to die on that cross. And shortly thereafter, he was going to send it to heaven. And guess who's taking over the ministry? These guys. Jesus wasn't like the regular culture, and he didn't operate according. In fact, he's the one who turns the culture upside down. The Jewish people of that day are just like us today, right? Our, our, our social structure is not near as rigid or as tight, but the things that we look at when we come into a crowd and the things that they looked at when they came into a crowd were much the same. They wanted to see who are the important people, who are the, who are the pillars of the, of the community, who are the well-dressed, who are the ones that got it together. But when Jesus came into a crowd, he looked at the crowd exactly the opposite way. Jesus' eyes were always on the small, the lightly esteemed, the broken, the hurting, and after three years of ministry with him, his disciples should have known that. They should have known that when they were, these parents were bringing their children, that Jesus would be the one that would say, no, I want to see him. That's why he's indignant. That's why he's hurt. Because these are the guys that very shortly are going to be taking over. And they're going to go, therefore, and make disciples baptizing in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, teaching all the things that I have commanded. How can they teach when they don't even look at the crowd right? When they don't even see what I see? That's why he's indignant. But how do we apply this? Right? Because if you think about baptism or bringing your sons and daughters to worship, with the, with the prayer and the desire that Jesus would touch them through the preaching, through the teaching. And nobody here is going to stop people. We're not going to stop you. Wait a sec. We've got children's church now. That's in the back. This is reserved for adults, only for people of special standing. Nobody's going to do that. So how does this apply to us? And I think perhaps it applies to us the same way. Maybe we should look at ourselves. How do we look at people? Do I look at people according to the cross or do I look at them according to the flesh? You know, if I were downtown and, and I hear somebody around the corner, I hear a speaker or something and they sound like they got it together and I think, oh, okay, well, I'll go around the corner and listen to them. And you go around the corner and there's a crowd in front of them. And as you make your way, you want to find a good place to stand but you notice, who are you going to stand by? Over here, you've got well-dressed, well-put-together people that seem like they're polite society. My tendency would be to go there. On the other hand, over here, we've got some homeless people. And as I walk by them, I can smell them. 
Homeless people stink. Right? You wear the same clothes for several days. You drink, you smoke, which many of them do. A lot of times you smell. Nah, I'm going to go over here. I just failed, didn't I? I just failed the smell test to my Lord, didn't I? Because I'm not looking at that crowd at all like he does. Because he didn't come to heal those who were well, those who were well put together. He came to heal the broken. And I hope that when I said homeless people stink, that it kind of hit you a little bit. I don't like it when he says that. Eh. Preacher should stay away from language like that. I said it on purpose. Because I think of how our Lord Jesus Christ looks at you and me. Would you and I pass the smell test? Or would he see through our religious garb? Would he see through our righteousness? We're twicers. We go to Bible study. We give 10%, etc. We love Jesus. But would he see that thing underneath? that every one of us has, all those flaws, that there's people in our lives that we don't like. There's people in our lives that, that have fallen away and, and we've reached out to them, but at a certain point we gave up. Ugh. You see, because he sees everything. I know this. that I didn't come into the kingdom because I looked right. And neither did you. And so maybe when we look at the disciples' actions, we think to ourselves, we should think to ourselves, they still don't get it, do I? There's this text in 2 Corinthians where it says that, um, the Apostle Paul says, I will no longer consider people according to the flesh. That's really just been on my mind because that's how we look at people, even in a religious sense. We look at them according to the flesh. If everything looks right, then they're up here. If things don't look right, then they're down here. And the Apostle Paul is saying, that's the way I used to look at it, but no more. I'm going to look at it through the eyes and the light of the cross. And through the eyes and the light of the cross, everybody that's broken down and they don't look right are exactly the people I should be looking at and thinking, you know what? That's who I am without Jesus. That's who I am without his word and spirit. That's who I am without his power in my life. That's the person who needs my prayer. That's the person who needs my love. That's the person who I I should be looking at and regarding because that's who Jesus would be looking at. And I think that's what the disciples, that little piece, and the disciples rebuked them. Are we those who rebuke and look down on others according to the flesh? Or do we see them the way that Jesus does? And I hope and pray that by God's grace that God continues to grow us in ways that we can, that we'll see the small, the despised. For listen to what Jesus says. Let the children come to me. Do not hinder them, for to such belongs the kingdom of God. I I really find that powerful because, you know, a lot of us have thought, because we look at it through the American culture and context, we look at what that's saying, and we're saying, you know, well, the kids are really little, and and when they're really little, they love their mom and dad, and they got a little bit of innocence, and, 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 and we look at that, and we think that's what he's saying. That's not what he's saying. What he's saying is is that these people have no standing. In the eyes of the culture, they're at the bottom. They are the very lowest. And what he's saying is, is that nobody gets into the kingdom until you get down to that level. I'm no one. 
I'm nothing special. I haven't passed the bar test, and, and, and I know the law, and I'm responsible for my behavior. No, I'm down here. I'm ignorant. I'm broken. And I'm no one special. Please have mercy. That's what Jesus is saying. For to such belongs the kingdom of God. Truly, I say to you, whoever does not receive the kingdom of God like a child shall not enter it. If you do not see yourself as having no, nothing in your hands when you come to God, because that's that child. That child's being brought to God. They're not there on their own, uh, under their own power, and, and, you know, Jesus, we're here because we've ch- achieved a certain standard of righteousness and we deserve to come into your presence. They're there because they've been brought there. They're there as a gift. But they're also there because Jesus said, bring them to me. Everybody else said no. But Jesus said, bring them to me. And when you and I have that spirit, that we see ourselves as the homeless, we see ourselves as the broken, And we say, have mercy, O Lord, even like the publican said. He did not even dare to look to heaven, but beat his chest and said, have mercy on me, O God, have mercy. And then look at what it says. He took them in his arms and he blessed them, laying his hands on them, laying that hand of power. Is there anyone here that would think that when Jesus did that, that child received nothing? I happen to think that with all my heart that when Jesus did things like that, those kids later on came into the kingdom because there's nothing going to stop them. When Jesus puts the blessing of God's spirit upon their soul, upon their heart, they will come. At a time appointed, They will come because the Spirit of God is in their heart guiding them and directing them. Brothers and sisters and saints in the Lord, I hope and pray that, and, and, and this has been on my heart too for some time because I didn't know this. I brought up my kids for a long time before I finally came to the realization that, and I was actually already a preacher several years ago, and I saw one of my younger sons, and he was very angry, and... One of us parents had made him very angry. Part of it was his fault. Part of it was our fault. But as he stomped away, it just hit me with so much force. I need to pray for him right now. I need to pray for him because only the Spirit can do this thing in his heart to take away that rage, to take away that anger, and to put the blessing of God's Spirit upon him. Our sons and daughters need that, right? They can grow up, and we bring them up as baptized children, but brothers and sisters, there comes a time they have to make that confession on their own, and it has to be real. It has to be something where they've come to know their own sin and iniquity, and only Jesus can do that. But the beauty of this text is that Jesus says, if you bring them to me, if you come in faith, if you come believing, I'll honor that faith. Without faith, it's impossible to please God. But faith is very pleasing to God. So bring your sons and daughters. Pray for them. I mean, a lot of time, do all that we can. And and as God gives us direction, give our heart, give our soul to this job. But more than anything, trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. And ask for his touch upon the soul and the heart of your child. Amen. Father, once again, we come before you. This evening hour, we thank you so much for your word, for your spirit, for your power, your truth, your love, your goodness. Your word is so beautiful. Tells us of of these faithful parents who by the working of of the spirit in their own hearts brought their sons and daughters to you, not even fully understanding who you were except just knowing that you were from God. 
and that you took all the bars and the gates. You took all the impediments. You took all the obstacles out of their way so that you could hold their children in your arms, bless them, and lay your hands upon them. Father, we pray that you continue to lay your hands upon us through your word and your spirit. And, Father, that more and more we would trust you with the hearts and souls of our sons and daughters. For only you can do that work of opening up their hearts and guiding them and protecting their, soul, protecting their souls at a most dangerous time in history. So much evil, so much, so much is being thrown at our sons and daughters from every direction. It is very possible that no age, in, in, no age of the earth has ever seen the kind of assault against the young as we see today. But, Lord, you are all powerful, all merciful, and all gracious. And you are the King of kings and the Lord of lords, and you have all authority in heaven and on earth. And so we come to you trusting and believing that you'll lay your hands upon our sons and daughters and infuse them with your righteousness and your Holy Spirit. Lord, all these things we ask in Jesus' name alone. Amen.